just have to wait. Well, he, when he turns, you'll then you'll you're gonna have to turn left anyway. So. Yeah, but I need to turn left later on, not here. So. Uh. -uh. No, you're right, yeah. Let's go ahead and slide over here. Hog body shop? No, that, no. Hall body shop. Hall's body shop. And this is Carolina. Uh-huh. Okay. Fifth house on left. I guess not. Oh, yeah. yeah. This is Mr. Frank Miller, who, Judy, I believe you said that he was uh, a brother in law of Red Lisk. Right. He was a member of the union, and you interviewed him when was it, last spring? Last summer. Last summer, last okay. Oh, when we were down with the you the Cannon kind of campaign. You went. Yeah, after the Cannon campaign. Right. Okay. Well, we'll see if he's there. Hi. Hey, hey. Hello, Mr. Miller. How are you? Uh, thank you. Good to see you. Mr. Miller, this is George Stoney. Please know you. Hello, Mrs. Miller. Uh, yeah. Oh, it's nice of you to see us. Mm. Yeah, I do. And this is George's son, Judy, James. And my son, James. Uh, okay, hold your Good me. to see you again. Oh, it's good How to you see doing, you, sir. Uh, How you about doing? a hug? It's been a year, right? <laughs> <laughs> and I spoke to you on the phone this yeah. morning. Yeah. How are you doing? I'm doing fine. Good. Have a seat. We brought in our tape recorder just because I, I was I just wanted to <laughs> film them saying hi. That's all right. Y'all have a seat. Lay up, Amy. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Shut down. All will. right. Thank you. Can we turn yeah. a light on? Yeah. Behind the yeah, door. Down, uh, behind the door. There's that round button. Turn it to the right. Just turn it to the right. That round button. Yeah, well, you don't know how pleased we are to see you. <laughs> I didn't know where you got to get here or not. <laughs> well, we didn't just heard them talking about severe storms. Yes, that's yeah. right. Is that right? Yeah. His yeah. daughter called said it was on TV. Yeah, well, I heard it while I go a little bit, obviously. Oh, no. Well, we've been around uh, Canopolis, I mean, around uh, Gastonia. Yeah. And somehow right. it seems every time we start out, it starts raining. Start raining. That's right. Yeah, they call it for severe thunderstorms. Yeah watch you know yeah you get a lot of blows through here don't you got a, what? a lot of uh, wind storms coming through here yeah but we're kind of down the flat here <laughs> i noticed that you're, mm -hmm. you're kind of safe here <laughs> yeah. yeah well Boy, you know that kind of caught you get me on that machine don't you? <laughs> well, <laughs> We haven't signed the contract yet. <laughs> yeah, yeah. When we signed the contract. <laughs> uh, I wonder if you could tell us something about your memories of uh, textile organization here. Uh, we know that it started very early. Well, I'm going to tell you something. The people that used to work in the textiles when I was working there back in the boat. They were so poor that they didn't sweep a piece of fat back meat over the table and sop it to shatter all it just went by. <laughs> 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 yeah. 
Both dollar supporter, poor people called her poor. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it was a rough life. Yeah, it was. It was a pretty hard life. Work from seven o'clock in the morning, get an hour for dinner, get off at the six in the evening, and work five days a week and a half a day on Saturday. And uh, it, it, it was a pretty rough life. I started off in the mill when I started to work at 16 years old. I made $13.20 a week, 10 hours a day, five days and a half a week. <laughs> so you can kind of imagine. And then the depression come along, and I forget what it was to cut me down to then. It was less than $13.20. And it was, it was pretty rough, pretty rough life. Now, you started working in the mills, do uh, you remember what year? When were you born? No, I was born 1912. But I was 16 years old, now you figured that out. Well, that's uh, 28, 1928. Yeah, I was 16 years old when I started to work in the mill. And it was hard to get a job back then. I mean, if you didn't have somebody to kind of pull for you, my father and the overseer, they were good friends, you know. And so he gave me a job in the mill and my job was starting off sweeping you see. I done sweeping in the mill then the next thing I taking out quill next thing laying up filling and then next thing I went to weaving and next thing I went to fixing looms loom fixtures and I was that when I quit. Well that's uh, that was the top job wasn't it? Yeah that was about the top job next to the, the foreman and overseer. George, I wonder, you know, it's been a year since Mr. Miller and I talked, and he doesn't know too much. It's, I'm not sure you remember exactly what we're doing and what our project is all about. And the air conditioning okay. is on. Yeah, what, what is this all about, yeah, anyway? Okay. I'd like, Could we cut the air conditioning, and then I'd like to talk to you. Maybe we should cut this. The old man Jim Cannon built the first uh, Cannon mill. They've done torn it down mm -hmm. now. Here in... Mm -hmm. And uh, fact is, uh, they had the first meal. And uh, I remember my sister, she did now, she was over now. Said she went to work in the mill in Canapolis, I believe when she was nine years old. Yeah, they used to work them when they just, I don't remember that, but I know her telling me about it, you know. Her going to work at nine years old. And uh, uh, you had no say, so they tell you what to do, and you 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 done what they said to do. You Did know you live I mean? in a mill house? Uh, before I started in the ministry, I lived in a mill house. I moved over on the mill village, and uh, I have to clean up the street where I lived on because, man, it was rough. I told the superintendent I was getting, you know, a little age on me then. I had some children. That I was going to leave. He said, no, I want some good people down here. And so it began to come better, you know. But way way back, Your Honor, though, you, you, you didn't have a say-so about nothing. But, I mean, you worked in the mill, and you worked, and they tell you what to do, and that's it. I remember they had a strike. I don't remember what year it was in, but the cannon, see, they had power. They called the home guards out, had the home guards at the gates, you know, to keep people, to let people go in if they wanted to. No such thing as a union. They were trying to get one, you see. And if you, uh, that's where my brother-in-law come in. If I'm not mistaken now, my brother-in-law, he was trying to help to organize the Brown Mill. What was his name? Uh, Haywood, but they called him Red. And later on, they called him Six Hour Red. He was trying to get six hours a day, you know. And his last name? Yeah, uh, Haywood List. That was his name, but everybody called him Red List. Now, I told her, I said, call his son up. He did have some pictures of him and President Johnson and all of them, say. And 
when the old boy started out, he didn't lived in a little shotgun house over there at the Brown Mill. And I believe they fired Red on on account. Now, I won't be for sure, but I'm pretty sure they did. On account of the union, you know. But he went right to work with the textile union as an organizer. Then he worked himself on up. I don't know what he was when he retired before he died. But he retired, had a heart attack and retired. And, and I don't know what he was in the union then. I know he had a big job with them. Now, we were talking with some fellows just yesterday mm -hmm. who remembered Red List coming to speak to the union. Uh -huh. And one fellow said, I joined the union because of Six Hour Reds. Yeah, <laughs> that's what they named him. Some of them called him Six Hour Red. He was trying to get six hours a day, you know, instead of eight hours. Get four shifts, you know, a day. That's 24 hours. Yeah. Now, what was the idea of that? Well, he figured the people were working too hard and too long. Yeah. But I, I tell you what, brother, when you went in those mills, you go in and you put in your eight hours of work. I mean, it was a job. Do you remember when the NRA came in, the Blue Eagle, and they cut it from 11 to 8? Eight hours a day. Yeah, I was under, under uh, President Roosevelt, I believe it was. Yeah, under him. What did yeah. that feel like? Oh, man, that felt like him in a way. <laughs> because, I mean, uh, uh, in fact, it, before they had all the labor law like they had, See, like when I went to work, it was thirteen dollars and twenty cents a week. They set your it wasn't no time and a half and like that for extra time. Work ten hours a day, you see, well they, you didn't get no overtime for eight hours. And you didn't get no extra time for on Saturday. You just drawed your salary. What they pay you. Now there's a building down at the edge of town that somebody showed us called the Union Store. Uh, do you know anything about that building? The Union Store? There used to be a Union Store. Now, uh, I believe that's what they call, wasn't that what they call the Union Store, Ellen? It wasn't done. Now, wait a minute. It was hooked on the old lock mill down here. Didn't they call that the Union Store? Company store. Huh? Company store. Was it? Well, I don't know anything about the Union store. I can't get it in my mind right now. Did you ever hear about a strike in 1921? Yeah, they had the Home Guard. I believe it's 21 when they had the Home Guards out then. I was trying to help to get that. I believe it's 21. I was trying to get help to get it organized. I'm about to get far on count out. Well, now there was another big strike in, in 34. Well, that must have been the one that I was trying to help in, 34. Yeah, in 34, the one I was trying to help in. What did you do? Yeah, but uh, I was fixing looms then. And I believe that's what I was doing. And I was signing people up. And me and my overseer, well, he was in with me and my dad. We had an old patent, you see, we got on the loom. And we had good friends. And... They were a little more lenient long then than they were back before. And he told me, said, Frank, you better watch out. They're talking about you out in the big office, you know. And I said, well, I'm going to tell you something. If these people want what they got and don't want nothing no better, I'm just stopping. I ain't going to have them more to do with it. See, the organizer, we'd go out and have lunch together now, I was helping to sign them up, you see, at the mill. But they would fire you if they found out. They'd find some reason to let you go. Now, how would they find out? Somebody go talk to them, tell them. Yeah. See, they're having a big court case right here in Cabarrus County now on account of uh, the union up at uh, Fieldcrest County. Yeah, they're having a court case now about that. And uh, along back then, they uh, they had there's people in there that would go and if you talk to them and go and tell them, you know, 
And so you, in a way, you didn't hardly know who to talk to if you wanted to keep your job. What did they call those people? Well, I don't know what they called them. <laughs> but I, I believed in the union, you know. My brother-in-law, he was a, I'd say a big wheel in the union, and, and I'd been with him on some of his meetings and things, and I believed in him because I didn't think the people were being treated fair in the cotton mill. But now they're paying a whole lot more in the mills now than they did, you know. They make pretty good money in the mills now compared to what they used to make. Where did you think your brother-in-law got his ideas? Well, I don't know. Uh, see, my dad, he always believed in a union. And my brother-in-law was a good speaker fact that I think the Lord had called him to be a Methodist preacher. <laughs> but when uh, the Union come along and had that uh, strike, I believe it in 34 when they had the strike, then him and uh, several more was let, they let them go. And Red, he just went right on to work with the Union because he's a good speaker and a good organizer. He went right to work with the union. And he worked himself up in the union. What, did you have a job as officer of the union? No, I didn't have no job in the union at all. I just told my wife today I had an opportunity to have been an organizer back then, but I didn't take it. Do you remember what dues you paid? No, I don't. But I don't know whether I got still got my old union book in yonder or not. But I did have a union book, you know. It, it wasn't, we didn't have to pay nothing much, you know. Fact is, I don't believe we had to pay anything. What we're trying to do is get them signed up and, and get the union in. But we all, every one of us, got a book that uh, joined the union. Do you have any idea how long ahead of that 34th strike you started organizing? Let me help you. Huh. Uh, the strike came in uh, August and September of, 40, of 34, and the NRA came in in June of 33 with Section 7A that said you had a right to have a union. No, I don't. I don't recall. But I'd say uh, uh, we started at the mill where I was working in now. Uh, Cannon didn't own that mill then. It was called the Brown Mill. Johnson's in Charlotte owned that mill. And uh, I'd, I'd say uh, about a year, you know, before we called for an election, something like that. It was about a year that I was trying to help to sign people up. And I did sign some of them up, even signed my overseers people, some of them up. <laughs> what about, uh, what did the women do in the union? The women. Well, to tell you the truth, we didn't have too many union meetings. Because if we would have one, they had people, the company would have people that, that knew the folks, and they'd be standing on the other side of the street watching, say, taking names. That's right. I remember we had one meeting at Hotel Concord, I believe, and there's some of them from the mill on the other side of the street watching it. We went in, you see. <laughs> because, uh, I mean, it was a scary thing for people that had job then, because you couldn't hardly get a hold of a job. You pretty well had to have somebody that uh, talked for you to get, get a job at the mill. Back during the Depression, well, I've seen them look like 30 or 40 on the outside the mill out there on Monday morning <clears throat> wanting to, or trying to get a job, you see. And back along during the Depression, let's see, what year was that in? Well, it started in 29. Well, the Depression, back during the Depression, uh, I lived close to the railroad. And I'd go down watch the train come through, take the children when I'd done, I'd got married then. 
and uh, be carloads of people going north, carloads coming down south, people looking for jobs, you see. And so it was hard to get a job. And people were afraid if they got far, that's it. So they were afraid of the Union. Now, when the small boots and cowboy had to get out of the get on his own way. Look how far you ready, Jim? Didn't start till he was 68. George Schumann died a lot. He was on that, that Disney Channel, Avonlea. Who was that? The Gray Fox. Oh. We don't have uh, He's a stunt man. He used to work for John Wayne, quit for 20 years, came back at, at 68, became a star. Yeah, I'll be 80 on my birthday in a few more months. <laughs> Look at George Burns. He's booked till he's 102. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He says he's got to stay alive. He can't afford to die. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's about the truth, son. We're rolling, we're rolling. Been a lot it's of okay. changes yeah, since yeah. I was a boy. You can come downstairs. Uh, you said been a lot of changes. You're saying that you can't tell, now you can't tell a cotton mill worker from a, a banker or something. Back then, how could you tell the difference? Well, uh, when I was a little old boy, when I was just a, a small boy, the first day of May, we got to kick our shoes off and go barefooted. And my daddy would take us out and set us under a tree and he had an old pair of clippers, you know, and he'd just skin our heads, you know. And boy, we enjoyed that, you know, skinhead and barefooted. And <laughs> when we go up town, why, you could tell cotton mill kids, you know, we wear a little overhauls or things like that, you know. And uh, you could tell the difference. <laughs> yeah. Did that ever bother you? No, it didn't bother me because I was just a kid, you know, and I thought everything was all right. But, uh, uh, I used to when I was a boy, you know, little old feller. My daddy'd come home, you know, from work. I'd run and meet him, catch him by the hand, and walk home with him. And in fact, I got some tapes somewhere. That I sat down one day and started to just recording my life story on a bunch of tape from my childhood up, you know, say. But I quit before I got through. <laughs> but, uh, Back when I was a little old boy, see, the streets in Concord wasn't paved and all. In fact, they had streetcars down here in Concord. My son got a picture of the street down here in Concord with the old streetcar coming up the street, see. Had streetcars that run around over town. And uh, as a little old boy, we'd get on the streetcar, caught the nickel, and we'd ride all the way to town, over around toward the old Gibson Mill and back. We'd stay on there to the conductor and finally say, hey, I think you boy got your nickels worth time to get off. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and you see, when I was a boy, we'd get out and hunt coca-cola balls and get paid for them, so much a dozen, you see. Maybe a nickel or a dime a dozen. We'd go out and hunt coca-cola balls and sell them. Get us a little candy or popcorn or something with Caught you a dime to go in the show back then. And didn't have talking pictures. I guess you remember them days. Feller sat down at the front and played a piano, and you'd have to look at the picture and read it, you know, as it went by. <laughs> and that was back when I was a little boy, you see, on the take doll hill. How much education did you have? I didn't go no higher than the 10th grade in school. My dad wanted me to go and finish and go to college, but I wouldn't. You know, I'd like all other young boys to get me a job. And got married, about 21 years old. And started raising a family, and then like to starve to death. <laughs> now, I'm going to tell you something else. You see, the big manufacturers and these bigger companies are putting the little companies out of business. If it hadn't have been for a grocery man over there at the Brown Mill and some of these grocery stores, you know, they had about all these mill hills had uh, uh, grocery stores it was privately owned. If it hadn't have been for them, half of the mill people would have starved to death. You could buy a groceries on credit from them. See what I mean? And uh, 
They'd say your groceries on credit, then you'd pay them every pay. When payday come around, you go pay them. And half of the time, oh, maybe not half of the time, but a lot of time the mill would shut down for a week or go on two days a week. And then when payday come, you didn't have enough to pay him for his groceries. He just let it go next payday, and then you pay him what you could. But I've said this a lot of time. Hadn't been my grocery man. I had five children. I'd have starved to death. Uh, trying to raise my children. And uh, I don't mind telling you this. Oh, it had been a good little while back. I knew I owed my grocery man some money, but you know, I never quit trading with my grocery man. Whenever these wind dixes and food lines and all come around, I still continued to go and trade with my grocery man, though he charged a little more than these other stores, because he took care of me when I couldn't take care of myself. And I figured I owed him a little money long later on. And I went to his home one day, he was sick. He dead now. And I went in, I had three $100 bills in my hand. I said, I don't know how much I owed you, but I think this would take care of it some. Here's $300, we're clean now. <laughs> and he said, you don't know how much I appreciate that. And I'd been owing it to him a good while. I knew I owed it, but I didn't know how much or what, but I'd still been trading with him, you see. And he had done gone out of business now, and, and he was sick. And I went to his home. But, but if it hadn't been for these uh, mill, uh, uh, stores on the mill hill, I'll be honest with you, people would have really went hungry because they, they took care of them, you see. I have known fellers, you know. Now, I, I, I didn't do this, but maybe owed a grocery man eight, nine hundred dollars, say behind that much. And he'd get the grocery man to sign a note for him, go at the bank and borrow the money, go pay the grocery man that, that you know, eight or nine, seven hundred dollars, whatever it was. And then he'd start a new bill. And then he'd be paying the bank and his new bill trying to keep it up. Oh, it was hard back in them days. It really was. Uh, I've seen the time when I, now, 4th of July, I was up a grown boy, man. And the 4th of July was the only day we got for a vacation. And I took the 4th of July, that was my blackberry picking day. I'd go out and pick blackberries all day and bring home. My wife, she'd make jam and jelly and all out of them, you know. And uh, we canned a lot of stuff back then. We had to. I even got out and tried to pick cotton one time to make a little money. But, man, I couldn't pick a 100 pounds of cotton to save my life. <laughs> but, I mean, anyway, to, I always tried myself. I always tried to have me a little garden because I realized that uh, every little bit helped. And so back along then, well, my wife there, she can tell you some of that now. She's my second wife. My first wife died going on the edge of July about 11, 12 years ago. Did my you, first wife did had you work in the mill? Yeah, but I didn't go to work until I was 40 years old. <laughs> I was just born in 27. Yeah, well, she's just 65. Mm -hmm. See, I'll pick them young. <laughs> <laughs> and I had a I had a big home see I was working in the mill and I felt the Lord called me to preach so went up yonder in the wine call community beautiful church up there now and started a church the first Sunday I had 50 something many Sunday school I believe it was 50 in Sunday school and a year's time uh, the first year, before I was even ordained, the first Baptist church preacher baptized 84 for me. And, and uh, uh, the second year, I believe it was, we done bought some land and built a church. And then later we remodeled and built more to the church. And there's a nice big brick church up yonder in the Wine Gulf community. And uh, Fellowship Hut, all of that, you know. And We've been talking with uh, some people 
who thought that the churches uh, were all supported by the mill owners and so the preachers were very much against the unions. Well, I can't tell you now about some of them might be, but the Baptists, you can't uh, you can't get a I'm a Baptist. <laughs> the Baptists are independent people. They're they're really independent. I mean the way we uh, we uh, work is the majority rule in a church. If the people don't like the pastor, they can vote him out. I don't care if it's just a small boy, if he's a member of that church, he got a right to vote. The majority rules in the church. The uh, fact is, if, uh, and I'm sure you know a lot about history, some of our constitution was written on Baptist doctrine, what we believe, freedom of speech and, and so forth and so on. <laughs> so anybody know anything about a Baptist church? And we're, we're, we're not a, a lot of people calls us uh, Protestants. But a Baptist is not a Protestant. They have never protested nobody else's religion. I don't know where you knew that or not, but we're not a Protestant. We're just a Baptist church. That's, but it, we got some big ones here in the United States. And, but uh, I'll have to say this, brother, and God been good to me. He has. I thought it, uh, I come out of the mill. And went and started that church. Well, then I continued to work, you know, when I started. I got $20 a week. The church gave me $20. Started off when we seen we'd going to go. They gave me $20 a week, and I was working in the mill. And we grew so fast, finally, I just, they had me to quit, give me $85 a week to come out. Well, I was making about 65 in the mill. Fixing looms about as much as anybody, more than most of them would make it. And I bought a home up there and didn't have a nickel in my pocket. This fellow had a house for sale across the, from our church right in front of him. And I had one nickel. And I found out what he wanted for it and I went down to the banker. And this old gentleman had told me, said, why don't you buy your house, preacher? I said, I ain't never had a down payment for one. He said, well, if you ever find one, maybe I'll help you. So I went up there and found out that house was for sale. I went downtown, saw the president of the bank that had it, asked him what he wanted for it. He told me, I said, well, I'll take it. I put my last nickel in the parking meter to go down there, and I didn't have a nickel. I said, I think I'll take it. And so he said, well, we've turned it over to a real estate man but said, he ain't advertised. said, we'll just take what we told you. I told you. I said, okay. I went over and saw this old gentleman. He got in the car, rode with me up there, didn't even get out of the car, looked at it. He said, it don't matter if it cost you $10,000. It wasn't nothing like that back then. He said, it's worth it. And I said, well, I ain't got no money. He said, you go down and act the building an old man. This old man had the money. Act him if he'll take one of my old houses. Take the deed and hold it till you pay the first thousand dollars. I went down there and he said, "Yeah, tell him come up here." I <laughs> and so next day we met him. I met met him and my wife met him uptown. And him and his wife were together, and he went down there and let him hold the deed to one of his old houses. He had a bunch of old houses, and that's the way I got my first house, my first home. Well, we've talked to a fair number of retired textile workers who all grew up on the Mill Hill and then they, as soon as they possibly could they started getting a house of their own. Why did they want to get away from the Mill Hill so fast? Well, uh, I'll tell you, it wasn't no easy place to live a lot of time. Because like I said, when I first moved over on the Mill Hill and with now I had some good neighbors. When I, after I got over there, stayed there a while. They got shed of some of them around there, and I had some pretty good neighbors. But uh, I think they just realized that one day they're going to have to, if you get far or anything, they're going to have to have a place to live. And uh, But up there at the 
church. I bought that little old house I got. Then I got the church to buy a home on Wine Cross School Road. It's a big old house. It's two or three times big as this house. It's a parsonage, you know. Well, then, years later on, they just gave me and my wife that home. That's the first time I ever owned a nice home. Had about seven pecan trees around the house, you know. <laughs> it's a nice home. Well, when my first wife died and I married her, she had this little home here. And there's no way for me just on what I'd get, you know, to take care of an old big house like that. So I just sold mine, come down here, and enjoying the fruits of my labor. <laughs> well, I know that these people, if they lived in the mill village, they were pretty well under the control of the, of the factory. That's right. Yeah. You done what to... You done what they tell you to do, say. And that's why I said a lot of them was afraid of the union because if they got tangled with the union, they're going to have to move. See, they lose their job and move too. Did you see anybody get put out on the street like that? No, I've never seen one put out on the street. But to tell you the truth about it, the people, they wanted the union, I think, but they were afraid to come out and say anything about it because of and you're talking about the machine guns yeah I've seen them on, uh, machine guns up on the corner of the mill and the home guards at the gates guarding the, you know to let people in and out and like if you lived down the road here somewhere you couldn't get to your own home without a home guard stepping out stopping you wanting to know where you're going and that made me mad. Now, I didn't like that at all. <laughs> now, my dad, he's a, he's a pretty old fella. He always on his own home. And he had worked at the Brown Mill, and during that strike, they came and tried to get him to come in. He said, I never worked under a gun in my life, and I don't intend to work under one. Even the superintendent come over there, and the overseer said, oh, come on in. said, it won't be nothing. He said, nope. That when they move the guards, then I'll come back if you want me. I said, I'm not coming back to work, and a man standing out there with a gun. I said, I've never had to work under a gun before, and I'm not going to start now. So he wouldn't go back, but after the strike was over with, they sent for him to come right back on his job. He went back. I had an uncle that uh, was fired on account of the strike from Plant 6. And he lived in a mill house, and he had to move. I was just a real small girl, but he had to move, and him and his family, he moved his family down in the country on a farm. But he drawed a, a he was in the Spanish-American War, and he drawed a pension from the Spanish-American War, plus he farmed, that's how he lived then. Because he was, oh, he was way up in his 40s then, because when him and my aunt married, he was 40, 46 years old, I believe. So he had two children. Well, one of them six months older, uh, younger than me, but he's retarded, and then the other three are still younger than me. But he was put out at, at Plant 6, what they call Gibson Mill. That's about all I can tell you about it, because I was just, just a kid, just a small kid. <laughs> you remember seeing the, the, the guards, the home guards? Oh, no, I never saw any guards. I've, I've just heard my aunt and my mother, you know, talk about it, you know, why he was, you know, quit the, why he was out of the mill, because he worked in the mill. You see, whenever anything happened here in Concord with the textile mill, Charlie Cannon, he did and gone now. But the cannons, all they had to do is they want the home guard, they'd come, see. I mean, they dominated. The town, uh, he didn't own the town, but the town practically belonged to him in a way. he tell them what's what. And, but he was a nice fella if you'd talk with him. But uh, they dominated. See, this was a, little old town was a political. And uh, back when I was a young fella, the Democrats, that's about all you know. 
and you either voted their way, a uh, fact is, in the Cannon Mill, they used to come around and tell you who they wanted you to vote for, and if they found out you didn't vote for their man, they'd fire you. See what I mean? That's how, that's how bad it was. And I worked down at Cabarrus Mill. I'd won the Cannon Mill for just a short while. And election come around. I went up to one of the Democratic meetings. When election come around, I went to the polls and voted a straight out Democrat, I mean Republican. <laughs> and one of the overseers down at the mill started to open my ballot, you know, to see, he said, which box? I said, I know which box it goes in. And I put it in the box. <laughs> But I did. I voted a straight out Republican ticket because of the way it were, you know. <laughs> see, the politic, see, Cannon ruled political party. And therefore, it was mostly Democratic. And they say who would be in an office and who would. Like, if you'd want to run for an office, you had to see a certain man, and he'd tell you whether you could run or not. And if you run without his consent, then you were there. Yeah, you were there. Well, one thing that uh, kind of puzzles me about all of this, we've been talking to a lot of people, is that so many people find it hard to to talk about this past. You know, they're, they're kind of reluctant to say people got shut out. Mm -hmm. They're reluctant to say they're members of the union and so forth. Do you have any reason? Could you explain that to me? Well, uh, and they talk to you now like that. <coughs> <coughs> well, just let me say this. So many of them back then didn't even realize what the union meant. They didn't know what it was. Too much about it. And now, say, Along back then, they were afraid to get into it to try to find out because they knew they'd lose their job or may have to move, and so they shunned it all together. Okay, now this is what the kind of the thing that's uh, bewildering us. We know at the time, we've been reading in the papers back then, yeah. we got copies of the paper. The papers were full of organization starting when the NRA, the, you know, the Blue Eagle yeah. said that labor had a right to organize. Mm -hmm. People started having meetings. And within less than a year, there were over a hundred locals of the textile workers. Not in here North, in Concord. In North Carolina. Yeah, but not in Concord. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Uh, Concord was a political town like, you say. Concord and Kannapolis. See, Cannon owned Kannapolis. That was his town. And he dominated Concord, too. Well, what made you different? Well, I don't know. I'm just a different fella, I guess. <laughs> you see, that's what a preacher asked me one time, Presbyterian preacher. I asked him, I said, uh, he was a doctor. I said, uh, uh, Dr. Moore, I said, why are you Presbyterian? He said, well, my daddy was Presbyterian, and I was brought up in a Presbyterian church. He said, well, uh, said, why are you bad? I said, well, Brother Moore, it's just like this. My daddy rubbed me on the head when I was a little old boy and said, son, I want you to learn and know more than I knew when I come up. And I said, I'm trying to do what my daddy told me. When I got grown, I said, he belonged to a Methodist church. I said, Presbyterian, I believe, a while ago, but not a Presbyterian preacher. That my daddy belonged to a Methodist church, and he was a Republican. And I told this preacher, I said, well, I tried to do what my daddy told me. And I said, when I got grown, I went to the Democratic Party and joined the Baptist Church. <laughs> he said, you ain't got no sense. <laughs> there are a lot of Republicans around. Uh, oh, they are now around here in Cabarrus County. Yeah, you'll find a lot of them around here in Cabarrus County now. See, I grew up in Winston-Salem. You did? And uh, we had a large group of Republicans up there when I grew up. Yeah. Coming down from the mountains. Uh -huh. You know, those uh, Yadkin and Stokes and all those counties, the Republican counties. Uh huh. And well, that's where my dad come from, Stanley County. I mean, not Stanley, but 
uh, Yadkin County when he was a boy. Where was he born? Uh, where did he was he born? You remember? He was born up in uh, uh, Yadkin County. My dad was. You know uh, which section? Was it Yadkinville? I think it, yeah, I believe it was around Yadkinville or Courtney One, right along in there somewhere where my daddy was born. I spent a couple of years of my childhood in a place called East Bend. Yeah. I was there from seven to nine years old. Well, my my dad and them moved down here when he was a young boy. Say, so he was just a boy. And uh, I think uh, my dad's mother used to run a boarding house here in Concord because uh, Joe Gaskell, he used to board with my daddy. Uh, my grandma, I never remember my grandma Mel, but I've heard my daddy talk, and Gaskell was a Jew. And he owned uh, what they call a hub down here. It was a furniture store and a clothing store, you know. And he done a good business. But uh, I've heard my daddy talk about it, you know. And they're just boys when they when he come down here. And his mother run a, a boarding house, and Joe stayed with them. You know, if they come, they came down because uh, the manufacturer sent up recruiters to to persuade them to come down. No, I don't know, but I do know this, <laughs> and maybe I shouldn't tell it. But my daddy, my daddy's daddy, he run a government still, so he must have been on the outside where he run it, see. <laughs> and, but he told me, he said, uh, uh, son, you didn't see, uh, uh, said it was a disgrace for men to get drunk back then. I said they had some that get drunk, but said liquor wasn't made to get drunk on. People used it mostly for medicine back then. And uh, he said he, when he was a little old boy, he had to get up him and his brother and go light up the old government steel, fire it up, you know, for his daddy. And said that was a place where people come, sit around and talk, you know, stick a gourd under there where that hot liquid was coming out, <laughs> to take a little sip of it, you know. <laughs> and I go up in the mountain now to tell me I don't know that one of uh, uh, the Mellers came over here and one settled up in Yadkinville, around Yadkinville, and the other one went on up toward Boone. Well, now, uh, up in Boone, about half of his Mellers up in there. But I met one feller up there, he looked just like my daddy. You know, I asked him, I said, did your grandpa ever make up on Hired Creek? He owned about 300 acres of land up there. And I up there in a revival and I went up to his home had supper with them and see you're at a big chain now when I was a boy we used to call and you was too we used to call it breakfast dinner and supper now they call it breakfast lunch and dinner see <laughs> well I went up there and had dinner with him and, and I asked him I said Marvin name him Marvin he did now I said Marvin don't act you something did your grandpa ever make any liquor up this creek here? He laughed and said, yeah, he did. I said, well, shake hands, cousin. <laughs> I said, we come from the same clan. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, that old boy did now, Marvin. Well, now, tell me a little more about, oh, yeah. uh, tell me a little more about uh, Red List. Well, Red was my brother-in-law. He married my sister. And uh, Red was just a, he a good fella. Now, Red was a good fella. And uh, Red could preach. I heard him preach over at Harmony Methodist Church. And, but Red was like all the other, other cotton mill folks. He was so poor, he didn't hardly have a pair of underwear to wear, I don't guess. I showed you them little old three-room shotgun houses over there at the Brown Mill where Red used to live in. He had a little girl. Him and my sister moved in this little old shotgun house, and he had a little girl, Geraldine. And uh, my sister was in the kitchen in just three rooms, you know, right? And you didn't have a central heat or anything back then. Had open fireplaces. And 
she was in the kitchen making up bread, and the little girl had on her little long gown, and she thought she was in there with her. She was in there, but she went back in the other room, got a whole piece of paper and stuck it in the fireplace, caught her little gown on fire, and she breathed far down her throat, and she died. Yeah, she died. That was a pitiful death, that little kid. Back then, it didn't have the hospital like it got now, no. And uh, so then later, they had a boy, and he's Richard, they call him Dick. He down in Louisiana, passing the church, he got a good education. He got a doctor, and I don't know what all degrees hung on him. <laughs> and, uh, but Red was a good feller, and like I said, he was just, uh, just an old poor boy. And I believe old Red come from out here in the country, come down the country. And he worked in the mill just like all the rest of us worked in the mill, and I forget now, I'm just trying to think what Red did do in the mill. I don't know where it was hauling beams or what, but he worked in the mill, wasn't making much, just like everybody else, just kind of from hand to mouth. And so when the union come along, and he got tangled in, you know, got connected with them, when everything was over with, you see, the strike and everything ended. They fired Red, and about every one of them that fired along then got a whole lot better job than they had, than they had in the mill. I don't know why, but every one of them got a better job. Red, he went right on with the union. You see, they hired him right off of the bat as an organizer, and he started around organizing. I was up yonder at uh, Cone Mill one time. This old patent I had, if we could have got it perfected, it'd have been worth a lot, a lot of money. But we didn't have it perfected, and so was up the Cone Mill, and old Herman Cones, he was over it then, cause the old man he had died, and I was there in his office, him and a bunch of them, you know, the little fellers, you know, in the office, and. I told him, I said, I got something you want, you got something I want. You want this patent of mine, you got money, and that's what I want. And in fact, I stayed up there about six weeks, me and this other boy, working with them on the looms, you see. But while I was out there in his office that Saturday, telephone rang. Fella answered the telephone. And old uh, Herman turned around to one of the fellers and said, Call our lawyer and get him over to Old Henry Hotel. I believe it's Old Henry. It's up there in Greenboro Hotel. Said get him over there right away. And he brought out a curse word. Said that red list is over there. And said he'll have that man signing the contract before he knows what he's signing. Said get our lawyer over there right away. Old Herman didn't know red was my brother-in-law. You see. Oh, he turned around just snorting about old red list, you know. <laughs> I just sat there and kept my mouth shut. My daddy, too, you know, was there. It was my daddy's son-in-law. <laughs> yeah, he said, get that lawyer over there. He said, that red list will have that fella side is up. Boy, he knows what he signed. <laughs> when the strike started, uh, what did you do? Uh, in 34... I don't remember where, I believe I was weaving then. I believe I was. Yeah, I believe I was weaving then. Yeah, I know I was. I was a weaver in the old brown mill over yonder. And did you know one thing? We don't have a cotton mill, do we, Helen, here in Concord now? Mm -mm. And you'd have one, two, three, four, about five cotton mills, but there ain't a one of them. In Concord. Now, the old brown mill, it was put up for sale. See, Cannon bought all of that. And uh, Cabarrus Mill, we called it. It's gone. And uh, the Gibson Mill, it got a little bit of finishing, finishing in part of it, some of it. And uh, old Franklin Mill, gone. And about all I've been in Concord, about the only textile we got now is in Canapa. 
and uh, they used to survive here in Concord. We survived off of the textile mill. So. Well, we've been reading a lot from the newspapers about what happened in '34, and we're just trying to check up to see if the newspapers were right. Now, they said that when the strike started, Cannon and a lot of the other manufacturers, well, when it was announced, uh -huh. they said nobody's going to come out. And then Monday, Labor Day, almost everybody came out. Mm -hmm. Just could you tell us about that? Well, they came out, and uh, I know a group got around up there at the gate where people go in, and you know, uh, trying to keep others out, and singing, and some prayed, and some sang, and all that. But some would still go in. You see. Some were still going in. They couldn't get them all out to stay out. Then it wasn't too long until they had the home guards around the gates. You see, keep people away back from the gates and everything. And then people begin to go back in because, like I said, they lived in mill houses a lot of them. It's either come back to work or move. Now, now the paper here, let me tell you something. Just a, just a, just a, just a, one second. We just want some more tape.